talking about engaging youth in the concert hall. Uh, today, we've got Greg Sandow with us today, who is the composer, consultant, member of the graduate studies faculty at Juilliard, and specialist in the future of classical music. Say hello, Greg. Hi. Hi. Glad to be here. Thanks for organizing this trip. Absolutely. Along with us is Taryn Cochran, specialist at the Regina Regional Opportunities Commission and creative marketing and promotions manager at the Regina Symphony Orchestra. I need to learn to say that right. Regina <laughs> that's right. That's right. Orchestra. Say hello, Taryn. Hi. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you doing this, and uh, I'm excited to be involved. Yeah, absolutely. And myself, I'm Chip Clark. I am a, an active com uh, classical music blogger on Interchanging Idioms. I'm also a composer, and I work with a variety of different orchestras currently right now. My primary position is with uh, Symphony, in which I'm doing uh, the social media aspect. Again, today's conversation is kind of engaging youth in the concert hall. Uh, we've seen over the past few years kind of a steady decline. I don't want to say in the past few years it's actually been a kind of a, a long-going trend uh, over the past 50 and 60 years of an aging audience. And the question is, how do we engage the youth to return to the concert hall or come to the concert hall first and uh, enjoy that experience so they want to make it a lifelong habit? So, kind of open the floor. Anybody got any thoughts immediately? Yeah, um, what uh, what the Virginia Symphony Orchestra has done in the past, which is really good actually, is uh, they. I mean, the the first and foremost thing people do is drop ticket prices. Um, what they've done is they've partnered up with a company called Scotia Bank, which is a major financial institution in Canada, and we offer classically hit tickets. And what that basically means is that if you're under 30, you get tickets for $13 two weeks prior to every concert. We've also now this year offered $7 tickets for students, um, any kind of university, school students, to kind of engage that audience. And it also ties in, we have an education and outreach program um, where we have students, we teach students in schools, and we have a build the band program that goes on as well. Um, what also we've done is we've brought concerts such as video games live to bring in that new crowd, right? The younger people that like the video game music, and they wonder, where did I hear, you know, they love the classical, but they... They want to kind of connect it to something they're familiar with today. Um, so that's a couple of the options of things we've done. Um, I really like the idea in terms of the video game aspect. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah. mean, Pacific Symphony just, or I should say the, the game Diablo 3 just came out, um, yeah. at which Pacific Symphony had recorded the score. And it was really amazing on social media watching the enthusiasm, the excitement that was mm -hmm. going on with that as well as all of the uh, excitement around the other aspects that we were doing. Um, so, I mean, yeah, you're right. Getting programming music that is accessible and interesting and something that they all work resonate with is kind of a good plus. But you, you know, to that, Greg? But I th what, yeah, I think what nobody does, though, is put the video game music on the same concert with Mozart and Shostakovich, which yeah. would be the yeah. thing you need to do if you actually want it to blend over. We want people to come for video games and get involved in the rest. Otherwise, it's a special product line for the orchestra, which is fine. And orchestras need as many product lines as they can have to reach as many people. But I don't think it really gets, it, it doesn't attract the central problem. Now, I'll, I'll give you, I'm sorry, Taryn, you're, you're, you're just breathless. You want to say something? No, I was going to say, no, go ahead, go ahead. I'll go okay. out, I'll wait. Here. I'll, yeah. I'll just give you my, 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 my perspective. Definitely. I think that this is the key problem for classical music institutions, and that attracting a new young audience should be absolutely the highest priority. And I know that that's also impossible in a way, because the old audience is keeping the institution alive and gives more money than a young audience would. But looking into the not too distant future, there just are not gonna be people who wanna hear classical music in the present form in the numbers we have now, maybe not in the numbers to sustain the institution. So I think that we really have to make this the number one priority and really kick butt about it. And I think, jumping ahead, you know, to the question about concert etiquette, I don't think that concert etiquette itself is the whole problem. It's the concert period. You walk in, I'm talking about the average orchestra concert, and the Pacific Symphony, from what I hear, could be really different from this, and I could hope that the Regina one is too, but the orchestra concerts I've been to, big and small orchestras, you walk in, there is no sense of excitement, no sense of anticipation. The musicians look bored. When I watched the New York Philharmonic play Rhapsody in Blue on New Year's Eve, 
on TV. They look glum. They look distressed, actually. Um, then they Which smiled really, after them. Yeah, they really did. But they, it's really frustrating because that's such a great piece. I mean, it's it such is. an exciting piece of it music is. to and have John musicians go. As the soloist was doing great stuff. But anyway, so you need to change the whole atmosphere. People have to come in and you have to say, I know who these musicians are. I know why they're playing this music. They mm -hmm. have told me this piece means X to me. It means this in my life. Here's what we try to achieve in performing it. Here are the hard parts for us to play. Here are the difficult parts. And then there have to be ways for the audience to participate, both on during concerts and not, because that's what current culture is about. I think people should be free to applaud whenever they want, which was the practice well into the 19th century. And Mozart gloried in it. He wrote a letter to his father explaining how he crafted one of his symphonies to get the audience to applaud. And I was working with the Pittsburgh Symphony once, and we played that symphony, the Paris Symphony. And I told the audience to applaud whenever they wanted. And I have never seen such attentive people. One of the great things is that they applauded so differently for different passages. And as soon as something new happened, they stopped applauding so they could hear it. I'm almost finished. Um, the last thing I'm going to say is very heretical, but I think we have to play better. And I know that we all play wonderfully, but we don't play with listeners in mind. There's the orthodoxy that it's above considerations of making it different for listeners. And I'm not saying pander, make it simple. I'm saying do what's in the score. You take your classical symphony, Mozart or Haydn, you see con contrast between forte and piano written by the composers in the score, and I could count on the fingers of one hand the numbers of times that's been vivid to me in a performance. You know, I want to be swept off my feet by the forte. I want to lean forward in anticipation when I hear the piano. I want people to really engage the music more vividly than they do. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> no, that's great, great. That's, um, and there were some things that while you were talking that I, I wanted to, to kind of highlight on. Uh, definitely the idea of engaging the musicians, engaging the audience and saying, you know, this is what this music means to me. I read a couple of blog posts that were talking about musicians using social, social media. I did a survey a while back. Um, one of the other organizations I'm involved with, it kind of actually started, was Twitter cool. Symphony. Um, and the whole aspect of that was these musicians who were using social media, engaging the audience, and actually doing a lot of the PR for Twitter Symphony. One of the things that happens with a more traditional symphony is fewer of the musicians are involved. And one of the things that I've heard from musicians, particularly musicians who are involved in full-time orchestras, um, uh, 52 week orchestras are the kind of statement of oh, we just don't have time. I mean, we're, we're, we're incredibly busy with that. And the unfortunate response, that in response, unfortunately, kind of leads to the question of you don't have time to promote the music that you're playing, even the occasional tweet. Now, I will understand that getting involved in Twitter and getting involved in Facebook and, and all of the other social media aspects can be consuming. But it's one way with which the musicians can talk directly to their friends, their associates, and a wider audience and say, this is what this music means to me. Mm -hmm. The music, yeah. they're passionate. And, or, and if they're passionate about it, one of the ways that they can get out to an audience who isn't going to the concert hall yet is to talk to them over social media and to say, this is why I'm passionate. This is what we're playing, and this is why I really love this piece. But then you have to have the other instance, and that you pointed out to that, that Greg, in the come onto the stage, it has to be, uh, okay, you know, I've, I've come to work. Now, I know what the feeling is for myself going into the office and going, all right, I'm here to work. I'll sit down on my computer. I'll type whatever I need to type. I'll do the emails and various other tasks I have. But a musician can't afford to do that when they walk on stage. They've got to say, you know, those 10 minutes, those 15 minutes before the conductor comes on stage is part of the performance. It is let me, hard with the audience. Let me say something seen. here. Let me slip in something. I yeah. was part of a funding program that the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation did for many years with a dozen or more orchestras. <laughs> and there were biannual retreats. At one of them, Bruce Kopek and I held a little workshop on why musicians don't smile while they play. Uh, he was at the time the executive director of the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. 
And we got about 20 people from a variety of big and small orchestras. And you know what their answer was? Why should we smile? The conductors are so terrible, we have nothing to smile about. And so you think, oh, God, this cultural problem goes deep. But by the end of the discussion, the musicians had so turned around. And they really wanted to be out there engaging the audience. Um, one thing I would like to, to contribute, I guess I was going to say earlier, about uh, when we were talking about how do you engage the, the older audience with the younger audience, is I found that, for example, when there are so played uh, List 200th Birthday, how do you tie in Franz list to that younger audience besides the obvious, you know, Hungarian Rhapsody, Bugs Bunny tie-in? So what I did was I did a little bit of research, and you start to find out really cool facts like listomania, you know, the pre-Beatles mania where people were mentally insane because they, they you know, they were fawning over list. And I tie in that to people and explain to them and tell them that story, and it gets the younger audience. When you tell them a cool story like that, it brings them into the younger, or sorry, it brings them into be more interested in classical music, much like polka music. Um, it's a hard sell, but if you can convince people. If you can tell them some really cool information that, that intrigues them, they generally will be more apt to, to want to listen to you, right? You know, I had a, a wonderful, interesting experience listening to Chris Bowie in concert. He's a pop artist. Yep. He was being backed by a symphony. Um, and he has he's written a piece of uh, compliments or uh, commissioned by the government of the Ukraine. But he was, he was commissioned a piece, and he wrote a piece on Chopin, uh, yep. Chopin's Prelude in C. It's absolutely gorgeous. You know when you're listening to it, you can hear the themes that he's talking about, you know, and you recognize the themes, and you're going, oh, it's the, yes, I know that piece. I, I've heard that piece many, many times before. But he brought it into a live element. Well, the nice thing that I would have loved to have had in that same concert, now again, we're talking a Pops concert, so we're featuring, featuring Chris Bode. So that concert didn't necessarily have the feature, but... If an orchestra were to play something like that and then play a couple of other dances by Dvorak or Brahms or, and something that ties into, you know what, these are the same elements and you'll hear the same music and you hear this one piece that you're like, wow, I really love that. I recognize those themes, but it's got a very modern feel and then moving into this other aspect. So, okay, we have lists. Wow, we love lists and, and like that, but... I'm a young person. I don't know who Liszt is and why would I like that. But oh, this was a rock star at his time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, I, I no go go on, Terry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I I think there's a danger that we're just apologizing for this music by trying to build connections. Uh, I think we should just do less of the old music and do it naturally because we love it in the context of the older music and not try to say, oh look. It's so much like us. The stories actually yeah. speak for themselves. But here's an anecdote that has just stayed with me. Years and years ago, I had a girlfriend who uh, was, had no musical culture to speak of. She liked pop music and undemanding pop music and stuff like that. I was a pop music critic at the time. I was music editor of Entertainment Weekly magazine. But she, who was getting to be around 40 years old, she sort of thought maybe she should like classical music. So she kept saying, oh, let's go to a classical concert. And then she saw the audience coming out of Carnegie Hall in New York one night after a concert, she looked at me and said in puzzlement and dismay, who are these people? Never said again she wanted to go, but this is the key. One morning at my house, she says, oh, why don't you put on some classical music? So I acted just like a classical radio station, and Sunday morning, Baroque music. I put on Handel, I think it was the water music. So after a few minutes, she turns to me and she says, why isn't classical music more noir? You know, as in film noir, dark, foreboding, morally ambiguous. And I said, oh, you mean like this? And I take off the water music and I put on the Lulu suite. And she says, yeah, why doesn't classical music sound like that? So now you had a person simply leapfrogging over Eine Kleine Nachtmusik and going right to a 12-tone piece because it sounded like her culture. So I think that we have to view ourselves with contemporary culture and in that context, older music will take its place just the way old novels do and old visual art. But I, I get a little way. And Taryn, I understand completely. And I have done, believe me, my share of doing exactly what you yeah. described. But I'd just rather create a contemporary atmosphere in the concert hall. I think that's a great idea, too. Oh, sorry, I think it's great because, I mean, if you can get people intrigued with the newer stuff, then they'll, they'll eventually some of them will actually seek out the older stuff, right? Much like... You know, they have no... They have no barriers 
because yeah. they just don't know it. There is a series in New York called Wordless Music, which did classical music and uh, cutting edge bands from New York. So basically, they would fill 800 seat houses and the people would come for the band. But I saw them cheering for Shostakovich Preludes and Fugues. I saw them um, cheering for no noise music improvs. I saw them che cheering for a Bach partita. They just love music. So yes, um, yeah. once you get them in, as long as you don't condescend to them and think you have to educate them, I think that they will like it. Yeah. And, and as, as a composer, I mean, I love the action, the, the, the comment that both of you were saying, oh, yes, let's get more music, new music in there. Um, I think that, that we run a, a danger. And uh, San Francisco Symphony, Atlanta Symphony, and uh, the L.A. Phil, I think, all recently got awards for uh, the ASCAP Awards for having adventurous programming which means they're engaging more new pieces this year, or at least pieces in the last 30 years, in this last season of programming they had, than other pieces, or than other pieces to hear. Uh, and they weren't the only ones. There were quite a few orchestras, but those are ones that come to mind. Anyway, the ideas of, of adventurous programming is bringing in new music. But one of the problems that you also run into, and this is kind of deals with the, the engaging younger audience, but don't lose the older audience, some of the older audience um, tends to go, well, you're, not, you're, you're getting too avant-garde, or you're getting too, you have too much of this new stuff, and it's really, it's really putting me off. I think John Adams wrote a, a wonderful blog post a couple of years ago um, in, 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 in talking about he was sitting next to a gentleman who had opened up his program, didn't know that he was sitting next to John Adams, who was peaceless on the program, and it, the gentleman turned to his wife and he said, oh, why do they have to have this new music? I don't even know what this piece is. And John Adams is like, wow, you know, it's really uncomfortable sitting there with the person not knowing you, having them already have that statement and not having heard your music. Now, now he goes on to say that after his piece of play, the person was, was actually rather enthusiastic. Wow, it was lovely. And then when John Adams went back, went up on stage and came back down, the person went, that was great. I'm, I'm so, it's so excited that I'm getting this next to you. But it is you do get that initial response, particularly, like I say, with some of the older audience, some of the ones that really like the established, you know, they really want to, they want to hear Brahms, they want to hear Beethoven, and then going, I, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear John Adams, I don't want to hear Chip Michael, I don't want to hear Greg Sandell, I want to hear this, uh, I want to hear my old favorites. So mm -hmm. how do you deal with that question? What, uh, what the RSO has actually done, too, is we've separated. We have in our concert series, we have a pop series, and we also have a masterwork series. So you have the option of going to the masterworks, which are all your, all your traditionals, right, that the older generation may like and love. But we also have the pops. But you can also, you can also purchase tickets for packages, right? You can mix in a pops with the, with the masterworks as well. And another thing I've done, we're talking about social media, is I like to engage people because there is no feeling... Um, that can be conveyed as, as as amazing as following a classical concert. You know, just a, you're so you're so fired up and you're engaged and you're excited. So I've actually I've always invited people to to contact us via Facebook, Twitter, and so on after like directly following a concert while in the concert hall because that's when people are going to give you your feedback and that's when they're most excited. And then other people see that and go, wow, like that seems like a great idea, right? To go check out a classical concert. Capturing the people as they come out of the concert hall. Yeah, again. Pacific Symphony did sort of that concept when people came out of their American Composers uh, Festival this oh, last yeah. year, and they did a video of which they were capturing, and they were asking, actually asking people questions, what did you think? Uh, what was interesting about that particular video is it didn't necessarily go viral, I mean, it didn't have 10,000 hits, but it actually did a really, really good response from the yeah. people who were watching it, and the flip side of that is, is that this video came out the day after the first concert, by the time we were at the fourth concert in the series, the fifth concert in the series, the, the numbers for the, the, the tickets grown, I don't want to say exponentially, but yeah, it was a huge response, and that happened very much in part to that video captured response of, what are these people saying as they're getting out of the... So it's telling the story. Exactly. Yeah, and I find that social media is it's honest feedback. Where people, you know, when they're behind a the computer, they're honest with you. They'll tell you if they hate something, they'll tell you if they love something. And it's also to, um, it's just a great sounding board, really. And it's such a great communication tool that, that people are more than, more than happy to tell you what they thought. So I just find it, for us to gauge our audience and find out what they're enjoying and stuff, it's, it's just the best avenue, right? 
I think you can also use it before concerts, long yep, before. Exactly. Right? See, like on, on one hand, I think you have to go down two roads at once. You're going to have to do some stuff for the older audience, some stuff for the newer audience. I know that that's scary because even the big orchestras are maxed out in terms of their budgets and their staff time. So it's not as if they can easily do that. I think, nevertheless, they have to. Second, I think that not all the old audience is so recalcitrant. And it's surprising sometimes when I talk to people in the audience or major donors how impatient they are with the lack of change and how much they would like to see something different. Mm -hmm. But then I think you need to engage them long before the concert. You need to talk to them. We treat the audience as very passive and we dump this stuff on them. I think it's kind of ghastly, you know, when you do a half hour long Elliot Carter piece. And this is nothing against Carter or his music, but you're doing it for an audience that certainly hates it. And so why are you doing it for them, at least without talking to them? Exactly. I was working with the Pittsburgh Symphony. David Robertson came to conduct. And we were talking. He had he was doing two atonal pieces, Schoenberg and Berio, on his concert. And he had talked to the audience, and he was frustrated with the response. I suggested he say these simple words, you might not like it. And when he did that night, or the next night, I think it's like a sigh of relief went through the concert hall. But I would say if you're doing a new piece, try to get the composer present, spend the mm -hmm. money to bring her in early, uh, have her meet members of the audience. I'm sure you could get an active audience council together of people who want to play an active role in contacting their peers and then have them network with the audience saying why they like it or why they hate it but think it's worth doing and then have this discussion really avidly. Simon Woods, who now runs the Seattle Symphony, he used to be artistic administrator in Philly and I was working with them and I, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say publicly that he had this idea but it was a great idea. He said, why don't we, after we do a new piece, invite people at intermission, since typically that's when the new piece is done before the intermission, why don't we invite them to go to the left side of the lobby if they hated it and the right side of the lobby if they liked it and have a discussion go on. So I would just activate the whole discussion and also honor the people who don't like it. And yeah. they have every right not to. Yeah, great, great idea. I love it, particularly the idea of putting the people up and, and right. I mean, if you, <laughs> if you had an opening half of the concert and you said, okay, we're going to play some pieces and then just before intermission, now it's we're going to break into these groups so that you can talk about it over intermission and have the administrative staff and maybe even the musicians involved in the intermission, in the, in the uh, yeah, during intermission, going out and engaging with the audience, both sides. What, what did you like? What did you not like? And capturing that feedback so that it's like, okay, we're using this, one, to engage you, but we're also using this so that we can better engage, better establish what we want to do in terms of programming moving forward. Great idea. Love that. Because, you know, I think that the audience, they're really interested in the orchestra as an institution and particularly the musicians. And they would love to know what everybody thinks. And if they are given an opening or, and are told, we care about you, and uh, here's why we want to do this piece, uh, they will respond. I'll tell you a wonderful thing the Pittsburgh Symphony did that had nothing to do with me, but I just loved it. They were premiering a Jennifer Higdon piece, and they put large numbers of musicians around the hall an hour early and invited people to go talk to them and have the musicians play them parts of the piece. And it was such a huge success that they then regretted not asking the musicians to stay a little bit after so that the audience could reconnect with these people and talk. Something else they did, which, again, I was, I was there for, but it certainly wasn't my idea, but it was great. They replicated something in Britain called the Master Prize, which is a composer's competition that involved audience voting. So they did the three final pieces, which were each relatively short, 10 minutes at most. And they had the audience vote on which one they liked best. And then they played that piece again at the end of the concert. But the reason this was great, I at that time was conducting, I was facilitating conversations with the audience after concerts and members of the audience. And this was the most engaged I'd ever seen anybody. They were so excited by the pieces, and they remembered them in detail, which was fascinating. I would say, so which piece did you like? Oh, that piece, why? Oh, my God, did you hear what the trumpet did two-thirds of the way through? That just knocked me out. And two people in my little group, I just love this, sussed out correctly which piece was going to win and deliberately didn't vote for it because they wanted another one to get props. 
So the fact that it now mattered what the audience thought really engaged them. And it was Excellent. new music. Excellent. 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 Well, we're actually kind of, I hate to say this, but we're, I, we, I booked a half an hour, and we're, we're, we've obviously the afternoon or the evening or wherever you happen to be. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to wrap it up today. I think this was a great conversation. I'd love that to do again. Um, but, gee, for those of you who are watching online, uh, tweet to hashtag A-U-D-N-G-A-G-E, audience engage. And uh, tell us what you think. Ask questions, whatever. Uh, we'll try to set up another com another one of these conversations in a few weeks, and you know we'll go from there. But again, Greg, very much thank you for joining us today. Taryn, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, your, you. your thoughts and and comments were excellent, wonderful. And thank you for setting this up, Chip. I had no idea what it was going to be, and uh, I liked it tremendously. Lovely to meet you, Taryn. Yeah, yeah, nice to meet you too. Yes. Yeah. Some amazing stories, some great points. I really enjoyed it. it great. Oh, thanks. Great. Thanks, gentlemen. All right. Take care. Uh -huh.